Thanks for joining us for today's program. Pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers has preached to audiences and touched lives all over the world. And today, he'll be bringing us a message from the book of Acts, chapter eight, as we continue our series, Living Supernaturally. People counterfeit a lot of things. Money, jewelry, and artwork are just a few. In today's message, Adrian Rogers warns of the dangers of counterfeiting your faith. Did you know why so many churches have trouble? Because there are people who are bitter and who are in bondage. They've met religion, but they've never met Jesus. They've never been broken at the foot of the cross. They've never laid their pride in the dust. They have come into a church, not for what they can give, but for what they can get. They've never met Jesus. The Spirit of God is not in these people, and they are troublemakers everywhere they go because their religion has never satisfied them and it never can. Have your Bibles ready and join us for today's message, Counterfeit Christianity. As always, this message and other study material related to this message are available on our website, lwf.org. Now let's join Adrian Rogers. Be finding the book of Acts, chapter eight, we've been going through the book of Acts, uh, living supernaturally. But we know also that uh, when God works, Satan works also. Here's a question, true or false? Satan is against religion. Don't answer it out loud. Some say true, some say false. Of course, the answer is false. Satan is not against religion. You're going to find out that Satan uses religion. It is one of his chief tools in his bag of tricks. As a matter of fact, if you study the Bible, you're going to find out that the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden was a religious temptation. It was a temptation not to be ungodly, but a temptation, would you believe it, to be godly. <laughs> he said, look, Eve, if you do this, You'll be like God. It wasn't a temptation to fall down. It was a temptation to climb up, to be as God, but do it my way. The devil, you see, is into religion up to his ears. Now, there was a revival uh, in Samaria. Let's read about it. Look in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached... Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There's always joy when Jesus is present. There's always joy when there is real revival, joy unspeakable and full of glory. But notice in verse 9 how the subject changes, but. Just underscore the word but. You know, when uh, God opens the windows of heaven to bless us, the devil opens the doors of hell to blast us. And whenever there is revival, you can expect satanic opposition, but. There was a certain man called Simon, which beforehand in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man, talking about Simon, is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon, now this is Simon the sorcerer, then Simon himself believed also when he was baptized, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now I'm going to stop right there, and we're going to pick up the reading and in just a moment, uh, and 
Actually, we're going to go right on down uh, uh, this morning, I hope, right on through verse 25 of this chapter. But I want to talk to you about the counterfeit Christianity. The three things I want to lay on your heart as we think this morning about uh, counterfeit Christianity, and believe you me, these things are very real. And if there were ever a generation that needs to hear what I have to say, this is the generation that needs to hear of the dangers of counterfeit Christianity. Three things I, I want to warn you about. Number one, don't be dazzled by the satanic force of false religion. Now, I chose the word dazzled uh, carefully. Don't be dazzled by the satanic force of false religion. False religion has great force. Uh, look in verse 10. It speaks of this sorcerer, and the Bible says, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. There was force in what this man was doing, and they were all dazzled by it. Notice verses 9 and 10. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Now, here was a man who was using sorcery. Sorcery is just another word for witchcraft. And by the way, witchcraft is alive and well in the world today. Witchcraft is alive and well in America today. Witchcraft is alive and well in many churches. You say, oh, no. Yes. And many people are dazzled by this. And uh, they, they fail to understand that there is supernatural power. What Simon was doing was not just a bag of cheap tricks. It's not just that he was an illusionist. He was in league with the devil. You know, sometimes people will get into sorcery, witchcraft, whatever, and they say, well, it, it, there's really something to it, Pastor, as if that exonerates it, <laughs> if, as if that somehow indemnifies it, if somehow that substantiates it. There is something to it. But friend, what there is to it is devilish. Now, again, during the Great Tribulation, demonic forces are going to be loosed on the earth and leading the nations of the world toward Armageddon. Put this verse down. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. The Bible describes some unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the, meat, out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. And here's how the Bible describes these in verse 14. For these are the spirits of devils, now listen, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Demonic spirits leading the kings, the rulers, the potentates of this world, bringing them to Armageddon. The key verse is the spirit of demons working miracles. We've already seen uh, that Samaria was a place where people were demon-possessed. And uh, when Philip came to the revival, many unclean spirits or demons came out of people. There is a deadly demonic force in the world today. Now, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be dazzled, friend, by the power of false religion. It is real. Pharaoh's magicians perform miracles when Moses performed miracles of God. So as we, as we think about a counterfeit Christianity. The first thing I want to write on your heart is this. Don't be dazzled by that. If some magician, some soothsayer, some astrologer, some uh, necromancer, uh, some uh, fortune teller comes and does things that you cannot understand, don't go trailing after him because you say, well, I know it's real. That is the point. It is real. That doesn't mean to follow after it. It means to flee from it. Now, here's the second point. 
First of all, don't be dazzled by the satanic power of false religion. Number two, don't be deceived by the superficial faith of false religion. Not all false religion is in, in the occult. Sometimes it moves right into the church. Now begin to read in verse 13. Now remember, Simon now has been a sorcerer. He's been practicing witchcraft. But now notice verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. <laughs> well, Philip has been preaching Jesus. And now here is this sorcerer, this man full of demons who has been practicing witchcraft. And the Bible says, he believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, underscore this next phrase now if you don't mind writing in your Bible, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now when the apostles of which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, for they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the progress, progression of Pentecost. Now these people in Samaria are receiving the Holy Spirit as they did at Jerusalem. Now notice in verse 17, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now watch verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now I'm going to stop reading there just simply to say this, that Simon, quote, believed, end of quote, but he was an unbelieving believer. He was not a true Christian. His faith was superficial, not real faith. He is believing not in the Master. He's believing in the miracles. He sees the power being manifest there by that uh, New Testament church. And so he wants to be a part of it. But he never has met the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, it says he believes, wasn't he saved? Read verse 21 again and look at it. Uh, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God. Now, I wrote a book. The title of the book, Believe in Miracles, but Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. God works miracles. Satan counterfeits miracles and works devilish miracles. Never put your faith in miracles. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon never did really truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not all belief is saving belief. Uh, you may be a member of this church. You may give mental assent unto the facts of the gospel, but you have never met Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to put in your margin uh, John chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in uh, uh, verse 23. John 2, verse 23. Let me give you the background of this passage of Scripture. Jesus had done some miracles in Jerusalem and in Cain of Galilee and other places, and people saw it. And when people saw the miracles that Jesus did, they began to follow him, not because they wanted Jesus, not because they repented of their sin, but they just saw the miracles, and they followed him for the miracles' sake, they were what I call miracle mong mongers. Now listen to this, John 2, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed on him, there's our word again, believed on him when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus, now listen, did not commit himself unto them. Now you don't see it in the English, but in the Greek, the word believe and the word commit is the same word, just translated differently. You could say, many committed themselves to him, but he did not commit himself to them, or many believed in him, but he did not believe in them. <laughs> they, quote, believed in him, like Simon the sorcerer, but he did not believe in them. Now listen to it. Let me read it again. And many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them, for he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, 
for he knew what was in man. Uh, Jesus knew these were not true believers. Let me read this to you. It's crucial to understand that what unites most of the people who call themselves born-again Christians is their claim to have had a highly personal experience that has changed their lives. You are born again because of certain feelings and emotions and experiences, not because you believe any particular set of doctrines or because you share certain beliefs about moral issues. Born-again Christians are increasingly becoming part of, America, of the American mainstream. A third of America's 77 million baby boomers call themselves born-again Christians. Many born-again boomers believe they have made a spiritual decision that is right for them, but not necessarily for everyone. Half affirm that the various religions of the world are equally good and true. And the younger the born-again Christian, the more likely he or she was to say this. A third of the born-again believers said they believe in reincarnation and astrology. Now, what, what is this article saying? These are people who say, oh, yes, I'm a believer. But they don't believe necessarily the doctrines of the Bible. Now, we have today a generation of people who are, quote, very spiritual, but they do not believe the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Listen, friend, you had better beware of the superficial faith of false religion. This man, Simon, was a believer, but he wasn't saved. Now, here's the third and final thing. Uh, we're talking about counterfeit Christianity today. Remember the force of false religion, the, the satanic force. Remember the superficial faith of false religion. Here's the third thing. Don't be destroyed by the selfish focus, the selfish focus of false religion. Do you know what the, the fuel that, uh, false, that empowers false religion is? It is selfishness. Now, you don't have to uh, uh, think too hard as you read this story to see that Simon is full of himself. He is focused on himself. Read verses 9 and 10. There was a certain man called Simon, which before in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out, now underscore this, that himself was some great one. And then uh, skip on down to verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, and so forth. Now, notice verse 18. Then when Simon saw that through the laying of, on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Here was a man who was so full of himself. What did Jesus teach us to pray? Not my will, thine be done. What did Satan say? Not thy will, mine be done. All false religion is self-centered. It focuses on self. How do you think that Satan got Eve to take of the forbidden fruit. He appealed to our pride. He said, <laughs> you be like God. You can be like God. All religion, that is false religion, put it down big, plain, and straight, the focus is selfishness. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Peter was talk, uh, uh, Paul was talking to Timothy about truth and wholesome doctrine. But then here's what he says. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. What drives liberalism in seminaries? Pride. What causes unbelief the Word of God? Pride. What made the devil the devil? Pride. What is the root, the fuel, the source of all false religion? 
It is the focus on self. It is selfishness. It is pride beyond the shadow of any doubt. It's obvious that Simon was in this thing not for what he could give, but for what he could get. Look in verses 19 and 20. Uh, he said, Give me this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. False religion and self-centered religion brings two things. Let me tell you, the root is pride. Let me tell you the fruit. You want to know what the fruit of all false religion is? Peter says to him in verse 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. That's a good verse. Learn this about false religion. The fruit is bitterness and bondage. The very word gall means poison. False religion is a poison. Peter said, look, Simon, I'm going to diagnose your heart. You are bitter and you're in bondage. I perceive that there is in you this bitterness and this bondage because your heart is not right in the sight of God. Bitterness and bondage, verse 23. That is so true. Now, even in his repentance, so-called repentance, this man is full of self. Notice Peter says, look, you are in the bond of iniquity. And notice what Simon said in verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me. Now, why didn't he pray? <laughs> why didn't he pray? Because he didn't know the Lord. Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. <laughs> he didn't say, pray for me, I'll get my heart right with God. No. All he is doing is wanting to escape trouble, difficulty. There's no change in this man's heart. There's no change in this man's life. It is self-centered, even repentance. There is the satanic force. There is the superficial faith. And there is the selfish focus of false religion. And I want to tell you again that the devil, <laughs> my friend, the devil is not opposed to religion. He's in it up to his ears. It'll be a great day in America when people stop enduring religion and start enjoying salvation <laughs> to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. A woman was in her house. A knock came on the door. She opened the door and there was a man there. And he said to her, Lady, do you know God? She was flustered, taken aback. She stuttered and stammered, was embarrassed. She just stepped back and shut the door. The man bowed his head and walked away. Later, her husband came home. She said, darling, let me tell you what happened today. Said, a man knocked at the door of our house and he asked me a question. He asked me if I knew God. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I shut the door in his face. I'm so sorry. I wish I could find him and apologize to him. Apologize, he said. You should have slammed the door in his face. What right did he have to ask you such a question? Why didn't you tell him we are members of the biggest, most influential church in our city? She said, husband, he didn't ask that. He asked if I knew God. 
Well, why didn't you tell him we are reputable people? We have a good reputation. We're well known in this community. He didn't ask that. He only asked if I knew God. That's what I want to ask you today. Not are you a member of Bellevue Baptist Church. Not do people think that you are fine. Not do you have manners and culture. Not even do you have religion. Do you know God? Are you saved? Oh, my friend, you can be, you should be. Precious friend, I remind you again that the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. <laughs> that is a hallelujah. Every blur, every blemish, every spot, every stain can be washed whiter than snow in the precious blood of Jesus. Would you like to have your sin cleansed and obliterated by the blood? Would you? Would you pray a prayer like this? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the power of your shed blood. I now turn from my sin to you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me, Lord Jesus. Save me, Lord Jesus. Pray it. Mean it. And if you do, write to us and let us know. We will rejoice. And we'll send you some literature to help you to get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's program has been a blessing to you. To watch this message again, listen to other messages from this same series, or to download today's outline or other related materials, check out our website, lwf.org. At lwf.org, you can also subscribe to our daily devotions from Adrian Rogers, delivered directly to your laptop or mobile device. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at LWF Ministries for inspiration and encouragement. Have you ever been hit with a situation that leaves you feeling helpless or even desperate? Next week, we'll continue our series, Living Supernaturally, with a lesson about crisis. You may be in the middle of chaos right now. Nothing seems to be making sense. Everything that you thought you had nailed down is coming loose, and the devil is pulling nails. Now listen to me. Just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean that it does not make sense. Join us next time for the Christ of every crisis. Thanks for watching today. We'll see you next week. Love Worth Finding is a viewer-supported ministry, and we need the help of faithful viewers like you as we share the love of Christ each week. As thanks for your financial support this month, we'll send you the Foundations for Our Faith package. These companion study guides to the Foundations for Our Faith series are designed to deepen your faith and help you build a solid biblical foundation. Prayerfully consider becoming a monthly partner. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.